Welcome to the highest IQ breakdown and analysis over the Jordan Peterson versus Destiny discussion, or what I like to call it a debate, okay? Let's get right into it, folks. Okay, so before we get too far into the video, let's get right into the psychology of this interaction, okay? Break down the body language even, so we're gonna get to the nitty gritty. So when it comes to Destiny, we know the dynamic is, is that he's a guy who takes copious amounts of Adderall or knockoffs, you know, you'd think you'd have more if you're rich, but anyway, so he has these derivatives of these pills, so he's locked in all the time. He spends about 12 hours a day streaming, I believe, to like about 11 to 15,000 people every day live. It's impressive, but um, you can see the posture is already really bad. Now, granted, Jordan Peterson's a taller guy. Destiny's like a 5'7", and not a built handsome 5'7", which I'm not even, but he is a scrawny gamer built 5'7", and it's brutal. And when it when you have somebody like Jordan Peterson, you've got a guy who is 61 years old, okay? So just watch how he daddies him, and I haven't even seen it, but I'm predicting it. Let's get into it. So why have you become known, and, and how has that developed? pretty broad question. Um, I think I started streaming around 15 years ago when it wasn't really a thing yet. There were a few people that did it. Uh, I started early on. I was a, well, I guess back then you weren't a professional gamer yet because the game had just started to come out. But there was a game called StarCraft 2 and I streamed myself playing that game. I was a pretty good player. It was pretty entertaining to watch. And then I kind of grew uh, over. He's answering it like a kid in a divorce uh, hearing or like a divorce uh, therapy session, okay? Like, well, I guess my parents, they didn't really love each other and I was like nine and like it was really bad and like it's just so awkward, please get me out of here. That's like basically what he's doing, okay? He's like in the middle of an anger management class or something like that. That's how to imagine what he's going through. I mean, the posture, again, just really, really bad. And the way that his body just looks is just kind of disconcerting. And he's over here talking about, I mean, it's just, I don't even know. He's talking about a game from 2011. Okay, so when I'm in the third grade, he's making a living off of a game, streaming it. It's called StarCraft. Okay, and he's explaining it with no passion, no conviction. It wasn't something cool. He didn't say, I started a church and that's how I got my cloud. Or I did something really cool. It's, well, I was like the first one, first geek nerd Cuban to like start a game thing. And it was off like this obscure thing, but there was a niche and blah, blah, blah. I guess maybe the next seven years, uh, just streaming that people would watch. Streaming on YouTube? I Look at the posture, okay. So Jordan Peterson has an awful outfit. He is spending a lot of money, copious amounts, tailoring these uh, suits. Um, it's really odd what, he, what he's wearing, the blazer that is. It's just super, super tacky. It looks like a bottle of Maker's Mark mixed with like Samuel Adams or whatever you'd call that, Captain Morgan. It's just really weird. And then beyond that, he's still comfortable. He fidgets with the pen, but it's like a normal like 60-year-old man playing with the pen. You know, your dad does this. Now, when you watch Destiny, it's way worse. Um, well, back then I started on a website called Livestream, then I switched mm -hmm. to Ustream, then I switched to a site called Justin TV, and then that turned into Twitch.tv. Uh, so after streaming there for like seven or eight years, I was a semi-professional StarCraft 2 gamer. That game kind of came and went, but I had a lot of other interests. Around 2016, I started to get more involved into the world of politics. It's kind of a left-leaning figure uh, mm -hmm. because of my background in like esports and internet games. So you see how he doesn't have the acumen to become a politician or any more famous than he is now the reason is is because he's like well like I, I was starting to get into politics in 2017 like as a leftist figure and uh so no conviction if you're a politician or if you're somebody with more clout even you would say actually i did this because i believed in a cause because i looked into it because i put in research and it turns out that healthcare for all actually saves these amount of lives and i saw it in the lives of my mother and my aunts that they had issues with such and such see he could pull from uh you know anecdotes and stuff that makes it seem cool makes it seem like he actually has passion for what he does and yet it doesn't come through in the way he speaks. And what, even when you're looking at his gesticulation, again, I'm eccentric, I'll move my hands around, but what you're not gonna catch me do is go like this, this, like it's like dollar store Andrew Tate and look how pale his hands are, by the way. Gaming and internet trash talk, I got, I had more of a kind of like a combative attitude and that was kind of rare mm. for left-leaning people at the time. So it's basically where my early political popularity came from. I think from like 2016 to 2018 was debating right-wing people. So was there a so you see people like Destiny midwits will hate on people like uh, Jordan Peterson or other people in the intellectual dark web, uh, which is a stupid name, I'll grant you folks. But listen, Destiny is going to go around and say like, oh, well, you know, Jordan Peterson, I could destroy that guy. Meanwhile, look at the character. Look at the t uh, temerity, basically, that Jordan Peterson has as compared to Destiny. That you can just tell that the guy's oozing experience, Jordan, that is. And Destiny just doesn't have that sort of confidence. And again, you could say, well, yeah, well, he's like 25 years younger than Jordan Peterson. And that is true. But at 35, I would expect you to have your personality solidified. And yet he does not. Okay, The guy's almost twice my age. And he's over here doing all these uh, you know, autistic spurging uh, affects. And it's like really, really, really weird game-like element to the debating do you think and, and is that part of is that part of why that morphing made sense no i wouldn't say so i mean if you and if you get really reductionist everything in life is kind of a game but it's not very satisfying uh i think i grew up okay again philosophy um jordan peterson he's a sophist he thinks he's so clever with his philosophy and he's like well i think life is like a game 
bro, really? Okay, yeah, cool. Nice attempt. Really? Like, very argumentative. My mm. mom is from Cuba, so my family was, like, very conservative. And then I grew up, like, listening to the news all day, listening to my mom's political opinions all day. And then I argued with kids in high school and everything. And I've always been kind of, like, an argumentative, type A, aggressive personality. So I think that probably lent itself well to the political stuff in 2016, yeah. Was that useful in gaming? Um, that, that personality? In some ways, yeah. In some ways, no. Um, okay. I don't know directly for the games. Okay, I've given you enough of a sample of how he's getting domed already. He's fitting into the archetype of the preteen boy being interviewed by like a 35-year-old woman over their parents' divorce. That's basically it. All right, folks. So I just skipped through like 40 minutes worth of a ton of arguing. Uh, Jordan Peterson just mugging on Destiny, dabbing on Destiny, in fact. But Destiny is going to retort. So after five minutes of a straight screed by Jordan Peterson about climate change and why it's a hoax and whatever else... Destiny is going to take, you know, years of hype about like, I'm going to take this guy down. Let's see how he does it. Pretty hardcore because I am not like a legion to certain political ideology. One thing that worries me with this constellation of beliefs thing is that sometimes when it comes to evaluating a particular policy or a particular problem, I feel like it's part of the constellation and sometimes it inhibits people from like taking a step back and reasonably thinking about the issue. So when we're talking about that was a word salad. Climate change. You mentioned the WEF sacrificing tons of people, the UN, global elites, uh, five times energy costs in Germany, uh, genocidal people. I feel like th this is part of like a whole thing where it's like, okay, well, let's take a quick step back and let's just like think rationally about this particular issue for one moment. Okay. Well, you what a douche. Okay. So again, he asked uh, Jordan Peterson like one question and then Jordan Peterson adds to it and then adds a narrative and then actually expounds upon why he thinks certain things, uh, recites anecdotes from the last, you know, several decades of its living experience, kind of as an adult should and say like, okay, well, you know, they had this narrative in the 80s. Okay. But there's this carbon thing in Germany and then it's nuclear power in Sudan, whatever else. And Destiny's like, well, why are you mentioning so many things? Just answer one thing. It's a very autistic, short-sighted way of thinking. Again, there's narratives, there's levels to the shit, so to speak. And he's not having the patience to see it through. Ask me what the motivation for anti-poor policies might be. So that's why I was well, trying I to Well, I did, but, that but I got all of those things before I even asked that question. Um, because I think it's totally possible that somebody might say, okay, well, when you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it seems to cause an increase in surface temperatures. This has been happening from about the 1800s. And as we started to track surface temperatures, whether the thermometer is on top of the Empire State Building or in the middle of the field, it seems like there's an average rise in temperatures. And people all around the world are observing this in some places more than others. If you live in Seattle and 20 years ago, your apartment building wasn't built with air conditioner units, you feel that now. If you live in a place in London and you've never had an air conditioner before, now that's not acceptable. I think that people on the ground can see that there are changes. And I think that scientists, when they look in labs, can see changes. It might be that some models aren't precise enough. And it might be that for reasons we don't even understand well, Economic models maybe. certainly aren't precise enough. Sure, maybe, maybe that Not might be maybe. true. They can't even See how he has no convention in his voice because he knows that he's BSing Jordan Peterson? He's like, nah, maybe, you know, I mean, kind of. Uh. Again, weaseling, weaseling. He's lying. He's duplicitous. He sees sport in just arguing for the sake of arguing. It's not that he actually believes what he's saying here. And use them to predict the price of a single stock for six <laughs> months. The economic models are not sufficiently accurate to calculate out the consequences of climate change over a century. Uh, and not in the when you, when you, I, I like the comparison because economic models can't predict individual stocks, but they do predict the rough rise of the market. You invest in the S&P yeah, 500, you get about, collapse. Oh, even with the cataclysmic collapse accounted for, you're going to see about 7% returns on average with inflation okay. over a long period of time. I wouldn't call an average a very sophisticated model in elegance to climate change. That's the difference between climate and weather, though, right? Is that climate isn't going to tell you what the temperature is on a given day, but it might tell you the average surface temperature over a period of one year or 10 years. And then that's the difference between climate and weather. That's, well, that's like the market and stuff. It is a hypothetical, but again, we're seeing more and more and more data every single okay, well, year okay, that so getting let's, hotter and hotter. Let's jump out of our cloud of presuppositions for a minute. Sure. Now, one of the things that... Oh, no, wait. Oh, 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 yeah, okay. Before I do that, actually, yeah, because okay. I don't want to say, yeah, there, are, there are some things that we've gotten. As okay, okay. Destiny thinks he got Jordan on this. Okay, so an hour has gone by straight, and he has been on the defense this whole time, completely like a whipped little boy. But apparently, he has something really strong here. Let's see what the retort is. Investing in green energy that have been good. So, for instance, uh, the power of solar energy has dropped dramatically in the United States, faster than anybody thought possible, such that... Uh, uh, solar energy is like competitive or beating fossil fuels in certain areas. If you, as long as you can set the solar panels up, you're literally beating yeah, fossil and fuels. And as long as the sun is shining. Well, it's, I mean, it still is. We're not a nuclear winter. No, yet, no, so. but it isn't when it's cloudy. And it that's why it's depending on where you live. There are places, right. equatorial places, if you're trying to set up a solar panel in uh, in Seattle, you know, you might not have as much like in New York City or might have as much. Uh, or in Germany. True. Or, uh, there or, are also, Europe, I think or there are, Canada. There are also other issues that are coming up that I think are obfuscating our ability to evaluate what's being caused by green energy versus not. When we look at energy. His retort was so weak that all Jordan had to do was wave him like, ah, Germany, okay, Canada, all of Europe. I mean, seriously, in Destiny, like a 12-year-old boy trying to argue with his dad is like, well, what if? What about this one exception in your logic? What about this one little hole? Well, solar things can really, if they're propped up by uh, by loans and subsidies, and if you're in the equatorial uh, you know, area, and uh, you know, like in Africa or something, it works great. Well, turns out a lot of people that are sophisticated, a lot of people with the money to afford solar panels on their own are in fact living in places where they don't get the sun all the time, i.e. Seattle, i.e. New York, i.e. all of Canada, i.e. 
most of Europe. I mean, this is just ridiculous logic by destiny. It increases Germany. Um, I think there's a similar constellation around nuclear energy, for instance. People don't want nuclear energy because they think of nukes and they think of nuclear meltdowns and they think of Chernobyl and they think of Fukushima and they think of atomic bombs and that's it. And that's stupid. And I agree with you. But nuclear energy is a totally viable alternative to other forms of. Then why does the radical left oppose it? You think it's just this map? See, you. For the, same, for, the same, for the same reason, the, the right opposes vaccines because it sounds scary and it's a big thing and I don't trust it. it well, the right has it. a reason to distrust vaccines in the aftermath. Okay, so okay, so he's going off. He's going off. Let's see. So Jordan's taking an aggressive position. A lot of these people in the center, center right, like Jordan Peterson, will try to avoid a lot of these issues and ride the fence and just be on a poach and just snipe at like all the stupid leftist contradictions in their logic. But now he's gonna add into the foray. He's actually gonna stick his neck out for the issue with the jab. Math of the COVID debacle. <laughs> well, because they were imposed by force, and that was a you very. Don't you get to choose idea. if you have a nuclear power plant. That's imposed by force too, no? You don't get to choose where your energy comes from. If you live in a country, you just you turn the light switch, and hopefully you don't have a Chernobyl that melts down in your particular town, right? Well, you get to choose it because you can buy it or not. Well, That's I mean, a choice. It does, but it, the nobody negative, had a choice with the vaccines. Nobody had a choice whether or not they lived near Chernobyl or not. Nobody had a choice. Really? There's a nuclear they can move power plant. Away. Well, I don't really well, choose to move like 500 miles. That's like telling conservatives when uh, Biden tried to get okay, the OSHA well, mandate for vaccines, no. like, well, you just get a different job. I'm right? not, I don't want to debate about whether or not large nuclear power plants are mm -hmm. frightening. They are. Sure, okay. And there are technologies now where that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and I think I don't. I think that's I a kind of the place for our discussion to go because I also understand why people are afraid of it. But what I don't understand, for example. Okay, you see when Jordan Peterson gets like he actually objectively lost on that point. You can see that he tries to obfuscate and like literally puts his hand out like, okay, please let's get to something else he uh, confidently like as in like a dad who's annoyed is like okay shut up shut up okay who cares yeah okay nuclear whatever it's scary but when destiny is on the back foot he's lying he's like well maybe the climate is actually pretty accurate because of this and you know uh, and i'm like touching my ear so you can just kind of tell the body language is very different example is why the germans shut down their nuclear power plants and the californians are thinking and have doing the same thing when they have to import power from France anyways. Like it's completely- Or burn coal, which is a million well, times worse. Not yeah. just coal, mm -hmm. lignite. Yeah. Right, and then with regards to these renewable power sources, they have a very, they have a number of problems. One is they're not energy, they're not energy dense. They require tremendous infrastructure to produce. They're, they might be renewable at the energy level, but they're not renewable at the raw materials level. So that's a complete bloody lie. They're insanely variable in their power production. And because of that, you have to have a backup system and the backup system has to be reliable without variability. And that means if you have a renewable grid, you have to have a parallel fossil fuel or coal grid to back it up when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, which is unfortunately very, very frequently. And so again, and so and I'm not going to say there's no place for renewable energy like solar and wind, because maybe there are specific niche locales where those are useful, but the logical, uh, what would you say, antidote to the problem of reliability, if we're concerned about carbon, but we're really not, would be to use nuclear. And the Greens haven't been like flying their bloody flags for 30 years saying, well, we could use fossil fuels for fertilizer and feed people, and we could use nuclear power to drive energy costs down in a carbon dioxide free manner. That seems pretty bloody self-evident to me. And so then it brings up this other mystery that we were talking about earlier. You know, what's the impetus behind all this? Because the cover story is, oh, we care about carbon dioxide, which I don't think they do, especially given the willingness to sacrifice the poor. It makes no sense to me. And I so grandpa's going off and look at the confidence in the way that he is going uh, about this. And, you know, uh, from the right, from like the hardcore conservative right, you know, from my point of view, for instance, I think he's kind of a softy. He's Canadian. He talks about things in a way that is a little bit like Kermit the Frog, but that's a lot more charismatic and confident and masculine than Destiny, who retorts in a way that is self-defeating and self-effacing even. And honestly, he just gets trounced because Jordan just keeps going and going and going. And you could protest in the Destiny subreddit. I can assure you is going to be like, well, um, you know, he's just going off and it was so annoying. But he's actually feeling a narrative and he's being entertaining. And Destiny is not able to do that at all. He does not have a stage presence. I think it's relevant to the issue you brought up, which is that people have these constellations of ideas and there's a driving force in the midst of them, so to speak. They're not necessarily aware of what that driving force is. Don't we, isn't it more likely that people are either misinformed or misguided than people are legitimately trying to depopulate the planet? I'm look misinformed and ignorant that's that's plenty relevant and worth considering and stupidity is always a better explanation than malevolence but malevolence is also an explanation and no i don't think it's a better explanation because why would we waste so much money sending food aid having bush do uh you know programs to africa for aids having other billionaires like bill gates invest so much money in anti-malarial stuff like why would all the global elites be so invested in helping and killing the people here at the same time well, some, so okay, well some of it's confusion okay you know and some of it's the fact you know many things can be happening simultaneously with a fair bit of internal paradox because people just don't know which way is up often but the problem with the argument okay so so you, you tell me what you think about this. Uh -huh. So, you know, Hitler's cover story was that he wanted to make the glorious Third Reich and elevate the Germans to the highest possible status for the longest possible period of time. Okay. okay, Destiny, for whatever reason, has Jordan on the ropes. What he asked wasn't even that complicated at all. And honestly, I'm surprised that Jordan got stumped, but he physically literally got felted. Like he's like here, like, okay, uh, uh, reach for anything. Hitler, Hitler, oh, no, no. So that's like the trope in politics is that when you run out of everything else to say, well, what about the Third Reich? Okay, so evidently he's resorting to some hitler comparison let's see how destiny exploits this weakness again you've been on the internet for like 15 years let's get to it
Okay, but that wasn't the outcome. The outcome was that Hitler shot himself through the head after he married his wife, who died from poison the same day, in a bunker underneath Berlin while Europe was inflamed. Well, he was insisting that the Germans deserved exactly what they got because they weren't the noble people he thought they were. And then you might say, well, Hitler's plans collapsed in flames and wasn't that a catastrophe? Or you could say that was exactly what he was aiming for from the beginning because he was brutally resentful and miserable right from the time he was, you know, a rejected artist at the age of 16. And so he was working or something was working within him and something that might well be regarded as demonic whose end goal was precisely what it attained. Bro, was what? The devastation of hundreds of millions of people and Europe left in a smoking ruin. And the cover story was the Grand Third Reich. And so there's no reason at all to assume that we're not in exactly the same situation right now. I think that's a great reason to assume. I think that Hitler's motives and everything that he was trying to do wasn't a secret. I, like, I don't think that anybody had to guess that he was incredibly anti-Semitic, that his Aryan supremacy was going to lead to the destruction of the murder of, like, so many different people in concentration camps. Like, none of this was a secret. It's not like he was hiding it. Um, he hadn't I mean, like, he, well, he tried to hide, he maybe hide the death camps, but nobody in Germany was wondering, like, wow, crazy the pogroms are happening as Jewish people. That's so crazy. Or, wow, they're all being shipped to just mainly the Jews to camps to work. Like, that's kind of interesting. Or, wow, he talks about this a lot in Mein Kampf, but maybe it's just a coincidence. Uh, I don't think you can compare, like, Hitler to people that worry about climate change. The worry that I have Why here not? is because if we're applying this, people, thought he, people in Germany thought Hitler was perfectly motivated by the highest of benevolent... Uh, if benevolent I, if I were to take this standard of evidence and apply this lens of analysis, couldn't I say the exact same thing about the conservative constellation of belief? They don't want to intervene anywhere in the world because they don't care about the problems there. Uh, they're anti-immigration because they hate brown people. Trump wanted to ban Muslims from coming to the United States because he's xenophobic. Uh, conservatives uh, don't want to have taxes to help the poor because homeless people starve and, and die in the winter. Uh, but like, I feel like if I... Some of that's true. And yes, you can ad adopt that criticism. I think the difference Bro. with regards especially to the libertarian side of the conservative enterprise, but also to some degree to the conservative enterprise, is they're, they're not building a central gigantic organization to put forward this particular utopian claim. And so even if the conservatives are as morally addled as the leftists, and to some degree that might be true, they're not organized with the same gigantism in mind. And so they're not as dangerous at the moment. Now, they could well be, and they have been in the past, but at the moment they're not. And so, of course, you can be skeptical about, about people's motivations when they're brandishing how can a moral we say, flag. How would we, why would we say that they're not as concerned about the gigantism? I feel like everybody is when it's a particular well, thing that they care about. You mean if whether they would be inclined in that direction? For sure. The conservatives wield the power of the government whenever they feel they need to address as liberals do. Right? Conservatives were very happy to well, see, that, for instance, abortion okay. was brought back as look, a state. Look, that's a, good, that's a good objection. I think that you're correct in your assumption that once people identify a core area of concern, they're going to be motivated to seek power to implement that concern. I think cancel culture is a good idea, too. I think conservatives uh, prior to the 2000s, if they could censor everything related to either LGBT stuff or weird musical stuff or something they didn't want their kids to watch, conservatives would do it. But now that you see that like liberals and progressives are kind of wielding that corporate hammer, now conservatives are very much, well, hold on, we need freedom of speech, we need a platform for everybody. And now progressives are like, well, hold on, maybe we shouldn't platform people. I've got, like, got no disagreement with mm -hmm. those things that you said, and I have no disagreement about your proposition that people will seek power to impose their, their, central, their central doctrine. Okay, so then you might say, and so we can have a very serious conversation about that, what do we have that ameliorates that tendency? In the United States, we've got a de uh, hopefully a form of decentralized government. I can't speak to Canada as much, but... Yes, well, yes, that's... Why the fuck? Well, okay, why... Okay, so first of all, just holy Jesus, like, how that veered into, like, different topics is kind of astounding. I I'm smarter than both of these guys, but I will tell you this. Uh, Jordan Peterson really was on the ropes there for the past 10 minutes. Now, what is more surprising about all of that is that Destiny, in and of itself, is a person that ought to be smart enough to deconstruct certain things, but instead he kind of just tacitly agrees with Jordan Peterson, even though Jordan Peterson is on the back foot. It's showing a lack of uh, bloodthirst in Destiny, who's a debater. And second of all, when you're looking at Destiny, you're also looking at uh, a guy, just in your mind, think about it. It's Destiny, and he thinks that decentralizing the government is good to avert and ameliorate these like giantism concerns uh, with the government, like in a dystopian sense, that could happen. And so that's underpinning the whole idea of bigger, bigger government and like this, uh, you know, the redistribution aspect. And so let's see if Jordan actually picks up on that contradiction. That's true. So that's one of the institutional protections against that, because what that does is put various forms of power striving in conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's a very intelligent solution. But then there are psychological and philosophical solutions as well. And one of them might be that you abjure the use of power. Right, as a principle. And so, the, and this is one of the things that was done very badly during the COVID era, let's say, because the rule should be something like you don't get to impose your solution on people using, using compulsion and force. There's a doctrine there, which is any policy that requires compulsion and force is to be looked upon with extreme skepticism. Now, it's tricky because now and then you have to deal with psychopaths and they tend not to respond to anything but force. And so there's an exception there that always has to be made and it's a very tricky exception. But look, let, let, me, let me tell you a story and you tell me what you think about this. He got stumped. Okay, so I don't know if that's, ha that's having to do with age or like some pill addiction problem with uh, Jordan Peterson. He has a history of that. But Jordan Peterson here is just completely stumped. He had a uh, Dallas Doe Biden moment where he's like uh, demented. He literally forgot what he was going to say. So a midwit would be like, oh, fuck, I forgot. But he just, you know, as an old person, he's like, oh, I have an anecdote that vaguely fits what I'm talking about. Let's see how he saves himself. Because I think it's it's very relevant to the concern that you just, you just expressed. And I, I don't believe that the conservatives are necessarily any less tempted by the, by the calling of power than the leftists. That's going to vary from situation to situation. Though I would say probably overall in the 20th century, the leftists have the worst record in terms of sheer numbers of people killed. So, I mean, it depends on how we're quantifying Not that. really. Okay, yeah, we'll I just mean, quantify sure. Mao. How's that? Direct death of 100 million people. 
So, you know, that's a pretty stark fact. How will and Destiny sweep it up? Well, then we're really not going to get anywhere. So, and I'm not disagreeing that the Holodomor happened as well, the Soviet Union and the and yes. China were horrible. I mean, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to, so, yeah, okay, okay, well, yeah, of course, yeah. So war of, I'm just saying, it, for World War II, it depends on how much you attribute the war does to Nazi Germany, et cetera, et cetera, but sure, like. But World War II wasn't that many people dead versus, Mao was 100 million. World War II, off the top of my head, again, I haven't looked it up yet. It's 80 million, I think, uh, um, but the right wing. So that kind of shows that he has a, a very uh, Eurocentric, and what I mean is like, his um, very limited historical depth of knowledge is predicated on the events, and I don't know if I should say the term, but basically the the killing of a lot of people by Hitler himself, okay? That six million, you know, he's hyper-focused on that, but again, disregard Stalin, disregarded Mao. That didn't even occur to him, even though clearly it was a lot more people, granted not as well documented as the other thing, but I mean, that kind of just shows that Destiny is really a sophist and a Wikipedia fiend. Largely speaking, I don't think that the left beat the right uh, because the right wasn't trying. I don't think it's because Hitler's lack of trying led him to kill less people than what, who ended up dying during the Great Leap Forward or during the industrialization. Of the yes, well, I also think it's an open question still to what degree Hitler's policies were right wing versus left wing, and no one's done the analysis properly yet to determine that. Okay, again, another very short sighted, very like on paper analysis by uh, by Destiny. He's saying, well, you know, the communists killed out of incompetency. Which, again, kind of undermines this whole liberal dogma in the first place and, you know, like progressive uh, economic models. But also, it, it's also like, okay, well, Hitler's more evil than Stalin, more evil than Mao. And you could really argue that. I'm not going to get into that right now because that's like way too complicated of a topic. But I will say, not to waste your time, that, uh, I mean, you, you don't think Mao tried to kill people? You don't think there was uh, quasi-genocides when it comes to... Even today with the concentration camps with the Uyghurs or other like uh, Maoist derived, uh, you know, the, the, the dogma that leads to the isolation of the Muslims in China, you know, parallel uh, comparisons there. Or, for example, the Soviet Union with uh, Ma Stalin, where he's like just killing people, again, Kulak slaughtered, etc. You know, kill every 10th landowner or whatever it's called. I mean, these are just insane policies. And I mean, that's nuts. And whereas Hitler killed over race and ethnicity and religion or whatever. Uh, I don't think Hitler killed people based off a of class. So it's two different sides of the same, the same evil coin you could talk about. But anyway, let's get back to it. Well, what do we because consider? it was a national socialist movement for a reason. And the socialist part of it wasn't accidental. Well, but the, I mean, there was no, uh, you know, cooperatively formed businesses that were owned by all of the people for the people and distributed to the people. And I don't think redistribution was high on Hitler's list of that's things true, to do. For, that's true. Yeah. It was but a strange mix that, of, sure. of well, totalitarian also, politics. I don't think it was a strange mix. I think it was a bid to appeal to uh, mid-left and center-left, the KPD and the German Socialist Party by calling themselves now insanely stupid again midwit alert okay hitler was a liberal the whole, i mean by liberal i mean like leftist okay there was never a time where he's like we should cut taxes it was always like pro family like uh, stipends paid vacations um you know like incentivizing pregnancies uh, extended paid leaves etc it was big government and you could say it was conservative in purpose but it was not at all capitalistic by no means, okay? If you were to compare Ronald Reagan's economic theory, which was uh, from like Arthur Laffer and Milton Friedman derived from those and whatever, that Austrian school of economic thought is not at all close or resembling Hitler's Germany or fascist uh, Mussolini-led Italian uh, nationalism. So when you're talking about these things, again, these are leftist countries, okay? And you could say they're more like right-wing or more conservative. Yeah, but the economic models are still very far left. And also when he says, well, these were not, uh, you know, leftist ran economically, that's not true, okay? The taxes were extremely high back then. And if not even high, they were just completely, you know, like the government just controlled all the money. Again, state-run healthcare, state-run the military. Again, the spending was through the roof. So, I mean, when you're looking at these things, they are socialist countries. You could argue they're not like of your destiny type, and they're, they're clearly not. But I mean, still very leftist. National socialist. I think it was very much like an authoritarian, ultra nationalist regime that pretty squarely fits with. Uh, people get mad if you call something far right or far left because they have a. An well, you know, terms, one but... of the things I would have done if I would have been able to hang on to my professorship at the University of Toronto would have been to ex extract out a random sample of Nazi policies and strip them of, of markers of their origin and present them to a set of people with conservative or, or leftist beliefs and see who agreed with them more. And that analysis has never been done as far as I know. So we actually don't know. And we could know. If the social scientists would do their bloody job, which they don't, generally speaking, that's something we could know. We could probably use the AI systems we have now, the large language models, to determine to what degree left and right beliefs intermingled in the rise of national socialism. So that's all technically possible. So, and it hasn't been done, so it's a matter of opinion. Sure. So, I, but, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, but that, that's something you could do. Okay, I so but, I was going to tell yeah, you this story. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, well, this has to do with the use of power. So um, I spent a time at, uh, with a group of scholars putting and analyzing the Exodus story in the Exodus seminar recently. And so the Exodus story is a very interesting story because it's a... Uh, it's a, what will you say? It's an analysis of the central. Okay, so he's cooking something. I'll see you when he finishes cooking the meal, okay? So Destiny just finished 
listening to Jordan Peterson for about another five minutes about an anecdote having to do with Moses and authority in the context of the book of Exodus and how uh, Jordan Peterson was working on a seminar for these that are popular on YouTube from several years ago. But anyway, so if you have any sort of knowledge as an American over the Bible, then you ought to retort with either contradictions in what he said or at least come up with your own anecdote, something like that. Let's see what sort of retort he has for whatever Jordan said. So here's my, this is my issue, I think. This is my issue with a lot of people when it comes to political conversations. I think that everything you've said is true. And I think that all of it is, it's, it's good analysis, but I feel like it just gets wielded sometimes in one direction. And then people kind of miss. That is a horrible way to argue something. It's, it's such a, I wouldn't even say wine mom. It's like below that where it's like, well, honestly, like I agree with everything you said, but like the way you said it was like, kind of like, you know, it get, it's giving and it's, it's like, whoa, whoa, let's shut it down. Okay. That's not rhetorically competent at all by destiny to say. Yes, that it completely and fully describes their entire side as well. Um, and, and the thing that I feel like the only solution for this is you hinted at it. Um, it's more than just conversation, although that's a good start. We have to go back to inhabiting similar areas. We have to go back to inhabiting similar like media landscapes. I think the issue that we're running into right now more than anything else is people live in completely separate realities at the moment, such that uh, if we were even to describe basic reality, how many illegal immigrants came into the United States last year? That should be a factual number that we can know. How many um, do you think? Somebody, um, <clears throat> I... The actual number... Oh, come on, bro. Okay, so he has to... Th First of all, just completely drop the ball on the Moses thing. He just didn't get anywhere with that. He didn't cook shit. But what's also interesting is that he is asked point blank, okay, how many illegals came to America? Now, you deal with contemporary politics about eight hours a day, every single day for years in a row, Destiny. Okay, so, I mean, you ought to know just the most basic talking point. Like, for example, if you were to ask a Republican over contemporary politics and he's really nerdy like Destiny and he's on Adderall every day, well, he should say like, okay, well, the deficit is about uh, 1.9 trillion this year, okay? That's obvious, okay? You don't have to be, you know, the smartest person to know that. So he can even refer to the right number of illegals in the country and watch him squirm. Probably in the hundreds of thousands. I think some conservatives think it's 3 million per year over the past three years. What a fucking idiot, okay? He's saying that there's a couple hundred thousand illegal aliens a year, okay? Just completely fucking idiotic, okay? Let's just use common sense math again. You're a smart guy, Destiny, okay? So the population of America is about 335 million people. Okay, so a couple hundred thousand is what, 300? Okay, so that's one third of 1% of 300 million. So when you're looking at it, it's okay, okay, so you're saying that the illegal population of America per year is about like 0 0.03, the amount of the total or whatever. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It's clearly over a million, plenty of articles, plenty of Fox News segment, plenty of Trump talking points that he's listened to have pointed out that there's millions of people coming in. So the answer ought to be somewhere between one and three million as somebody who doesn't even know the real figure. Let's see what he says. Years because they look at like border contacts or they look at asylum seekers and they're not looking yeah, at the Yeah, I think it's 3.6 million. Came into the U.S. and stayed? Yes, through the okay. southern border. Okay, so. Felted, 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 bro. And no wonder he doesn't see, and that's why a lot of liberals don't think immigration is that big of a deal, is because they vaguely have a notion that immigration is about the same as it used to be 15 years ago. And even 15 years ago, it was over a million people or like 800,000. And so now he's dealing with a, a, such a vast gulf of understanding, and he's not even close to approaching the truth. Okay, the real number was 3.6 million. I, as somebody who didn't even know the number, assumed it was 1 to 3 million. So I was almost right. Whereas with him, again, He's going from 300,000 to 3.6, okay? That is basically a 12 times difference. So imagine if, uh, you know, the, let's say uh, girls being abused on a college campus, let's say you thought it was 2%, but it was really like 27%. That's a massive difference. That's a huge issue. If it's like that big, that's nuts, dude. And so for him to have the understanding like, oh, it's only, you know, this small thing. Well, that maybe kind of shows how much of a fucking idiot you are and why he doesn't deserve such a big audience if he's not even gonna do the bare minimum of research on a plethora of topics. And he's gonna get away with talking to a bunch of Nickum poops on the internet that are more famous than him and destroying them because they don't uh, you know, try hard on debate tactics as hard as he does. And yet when you take a guy who has been known for pill popping and has been through a bunch of depression recently, like Jordan Peterson, over 60 years old, who's so old in fact that he can't even remember certain things as he's speaking them, you would think he'd have a better chance at debating him and yet he's still losing to Jordan Peterson. And again, he just fumbled huge by saying that, oh, it's only a couple hundred thousand going through the border illegally. It can't be 3.6 million. Okay, doofus. You know, the historical average is about a million. I understand, I understand the shirt. Well, the history, historically, there's like 13 to 15 million people who pull stuff in the United States illegally. That's like the whole history of illegal immigration in the United States. But some, uh, but hey, maybe I'm wrong there, right? That, so that's, okay. a, that's an example. That the the uh, 13 million number or the 11 million number of illegal aliens is a figure from like 2007 that's been recycled in the media, which shows that he's such a fucking idiot. Again, it pisses me off because he influences so many people into believing the wrong thing because he's lazy and he doesn't. Again, he has Adderall. Do you think I have that much stuff? No. And, you know, so 
But somebody who's like natural born genius, I see this sort of facade in sophistry and it just irks me because realistically I envy that because typically you'd expect somebody in his position in politics to understand what he's talking about and with conviction say like, hey, it's this number. But no, he's defending a facade. He's defending, well, immigration isn't a big deal under Biden because it's only 300,000. And then he's quoting a figure from 2007. If he were diligent at all, he would notice that, hey, how come it's been 11 million for 15 years straight and the politicians are bitching about it? Are they all just lying? Well, that would require some sort of conspiratorial level of cope and delusion. Or what is it? Laziness on his end. Okay, well, that's the bottom line. Okay, so he's quoting a figure from like 16 years ago, 2007. And he's saying that, oh my God, oh, it's only 11 million people total. No, brother, it's over double that at this point, okay? And maybe he doesn't see that many of them living pretty nice near Miami, but you know, you go in Arizona, it's tough. A couple of us living in a fundamentally different reality. Um, well, the Pew Research Group has established quite conclusively that the variability over the last 20 years for illegal migration in the South border is between 300,000 and 1.2 million. Well, the Pew Research can only establish, I think, the number of people attempting to cross. I don't know if they can, no, I don't know if Pew does like census analysis. I'd have to see- Well, I don't, well- Okay, the way they count it, because I looked into it in high school, was that they have a number based off of the, they extrapolate that for every person they catch at the border, there's three other ones that got away because when you look at the census, well, not the census, but when you look at the fact of the people in the interior of the country to the best of their knowledge due to like thousands of samples, basically it is that every person you catch, there's three that got away, which is just common sense. Obviously, you have a border without a wall in most of the places. So obviously, you're only going to catch like a quarter to a third of the people trying to get in in the first place or else they would stop trying if most of them got stopped at the border. So if that's the case, then clearly, let's say, you know, uh, attempted crossings that people were caught was a million, then extrapolate that to be three times. And then you have an accurate summary of it being over 3 million people total in here. And again, he has no idea, but I at like 16 years old, figure that out. So again, be diligent. Just look it up on the border website on the DHS website. It's there. Okay. That's, that's a but, different issue, right? Sure. Because I don't know how you measure how many illegal immigrants there are actually in the country. I understand. I just, want to point out, I just want to point out, I agree with you. I listened to a lot of Rush Limbaugh growing up. I understand the fear of having a government agency say climate change. Therefore we have. A okay. He just indicted himself again. I was listening to Rush Limbaugh growing up. Okay. So then you would know. Just based off of the fact that you're like one of these autists that, well, I mean, the figure of immigration being the same for 16 years, according to liberal dogma, is not accurate with reality. If you listen to both sides like he claims he does, I think, then he would understand that, okay? I mean, again, the absurdity in the amount of arrogance it takes to not even check this very essential fact into our politic, the body of America even, the composition therein of it, that's just absurd, in my opinion. Blank check to do whatever we want. That's yes, scary, which is what they are doing. The conservatives do the same thing, though. I'm, I'm not they claiming otherwise. Yeah, but the problem is I think people don't talk about it. So, for instance, I heard – so we can pretend now that the conservative argument was just compulsory vaccines are bad because they infringe on my freedom. That wasn't the conservative argument. The conservative argument was that mass deaths were going to happen, mass side effects were going to happen. Uh, there was going to be all this corruption and stuff related to vaccine distribution, to the crazier theories or microchips and blah, blah, blah. None of that came true. Absolutely none of the conservative fear-mongering related to the mRNA vaccines came to fruition. But now that's all forgotten. And that was what used What do you mean none of What do you make of the excess? Oh, my God. Okay, so in this clip, I skipped over the vaccine talk because that's played out. And honestly, I argued with enough relatives like three years ago about this. But anyway, you know, Jordan Peterson went off. But anyway, you know, they're going to talk about, uh, you know, psychology. And where, whereas that's obviously Jordan Peterson's wheelhouse. I think as a guy who's 35, you ought to have some allegories, some analogies, something to contribute. Let's see what Destiny says. A lot of malevolence that we have social guardrails for is that type of like selfish malevolence where you're not, I would argue, even the majority of malevolence in the world is usually people acting selfishly or being inconsiderate, not necessarily like, I hate this. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, well, that's why Dante outlined levels of hell, yeah. right? Yeah, well, exactly that. And I mean, that, that, that book was an investigation into the structure of malevolence, right? Mm -hmm. He put betrayal at the bottom, mm -hmm. which I think is right. I think that's right because people who develop post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, which almost only accompanies an encounter with malevolence rather than tragic circumstances. So do you see that? Okay. So when you're talking about psychology, it's not even using certain uh, terms or jargon in the field because obviously Destiny isn't expected to know that. But when it comes to making an example, he refers to something offhand like, well, something, hate somebody, you know, just gesticulate in certain ways. It's very basic. Whereas with Jordan Peterson's communication, he's somebody who is well-read. And so he can actually recite parts of, you know, the nomenclature within the book of Dante's Inferno, which I read in middle school. And so he'll refer to betrayal as a concept and then elaborate on that uh, betrayal uh, concept in the ring of hell the most bottom pit actually um in the book and whereas destiny oftentimes doesn't do something like a reference to a book because the guy doesn't read from what i can tell nor does he know it much and you can kind of see how it pays dividends when you're older to have all this wealth of knowledge that you can recite and actually pull apart uh destiny's arguments and so just look at that
they are often betrayed, uh -huh. sometimes by other people, but often by themselves. And yes, there are levels of hell, you know, and you outlined a couple there. Uh -huh. So I guess then my question is just that if you have people, so the kid that steals an orange from a stand, not because he hates the shop owner, but because he wants the orange or he's hungry, without some type of societal, it doesn't have to be the government, it could be family, religious, without some type of use of force, do you think that society ever exists without- Use force on your wife? Um, well, what do we consider? Ooh. considering force is withholding sex for instance is that considered force or is uh, what the fuck is that what you know saying we're well, gonna cancel deprivation a vacation of an expected reward is a punishment so um, so you could well no but, but i mean this is a serious question i mean yeah. look look if we're, we're thinking about the optimization of social structures mm -hmm. we might as well start from the base level of social structure and scaffold up sure. so right? I, 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 like if a wife is upset at a husband for instance would that be considered uh use of force i think a negative punishment you're removing a stimulus to punish a person mm -hmm. so, yeah would you consider that like a use of force or i would say it would depend to some degree on the intent the intent is to punish it well age, if the right? intent is to punish then then it's starting to move into the into the domain of force i mean look mm -hmm. Look, while we've been talking, you know, there's been bursts of emotion, right? Yeah. And that's because we're freeing entropy and trying to close and to enclose it again. Uh -huh. And so that's going to produce, it produces negative emotion fundamentally, most fundamentally anxiety and pain and secondarily something like anger because those emotions are quite tightly linked. Sure. And so within the confines of a marriage, because we might as well make it concrete, there are going to be times when disagreements result in bursts of emotion. Uh -huh. And those bursts of emotion don't necessarily have to have an instrumental quality, right? It's when the emotion is used manipulatively to gain an advantage that's short term for the person. And then maybe that's at the expense of the other person, or even at the expense of the person who benefits future self. Then it starts to tilt into the manipulative. There's a there's a tetrad of 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 trait. You see how brilliant Jordan Peterson is compared to Destiny, even as a centrist, where he's over here saying like there's a tetrad. When would that ever come out the mouth of Destiny? And again, it's one of those words tetrad that doesn't come off the mouth of somebody like Ben Shapiro or other people that are like sophists that aren't actually that smart. Okay, the people that talk fast. Tetrad isn't something they use. Tetrad is something you pick up because you're actually were read into psychology and you have a good understanding of uh, psycho uh, psychopathy that is in a WebMD description. And I think that's actually really cool. And then what's more is that when we're referring to Jordan Peterson here, he's also referring to different nodes of marriage that are actually instrumental. And what I mean is like, for instance, um, when you listen to some someone like him talk, you can listen to something he says and you're like, well, damn, that actually clicked. Whereas with Destiny, it isn't that, okay? But Destiny, it's like simple rebuttal, simple like common sense Occam's razor. It's not really the same mental field that uh, the other guy is at. So, I mean, it's blatantly obvious. Mm -hmm. So narcissism, Machiavellianism, that's manipulativeness. Nar narcissism is the desire for unearned social status. That's what you gain, for example, if you were gossiping and elevating mm -hmm. your social status. Machiavellianism, narcissism, psychopathy, that's predatory parasitism, and those culminate in sadism. And that cloud of negative emotion that's released in the aftermath of disagreement can be tilted in the direction of those traits. And that's when it becomes malevolent. And that's when the problem of force starts to become paramount. Because I, I think I think that your I think that your fundamental presupposition was both Hobbesian and ill-formed. I do not believe that the basis for the civilized polity is force. Now you're saying that you know you can't abjure the use of force entirely. And I would say unfortunately that's true. I but, agree with you. But if the if the policy isn't invitational, uh -huh. if I can't make a case that that's powerful enough for you to go there voluntarily, then the policy is flawed. Now it may be that we have some cases where we can't do better than a flawed policy because we're not smart enough. And mm -hmm. maybe the incarceration of mul of criminals with a long-term history of violent offenses is a good example of that. We don't know how to invite those people to play. Mm -hmm. they, they have a history, generally from the time they're very young children, from the age of two, of not... Okay, again, this is just beginner's like logic, but this is so key for public speaking. He's connecting different spe uh, like uh, different points in, in the sentence structure. In the sentence structure, I, have, I need water, but basically he's stringing you along as a, a listener and he's appealing to the audience in such a way to where you can picture what he's saying, okay? When you hear Destiny speak, you never get that emotion, okay? You never feel as if, like for instance, let's say you had to pay one of these two guys to narrate a story, okay? Who would be the better narrator for that? It would obviously be Jordan Peterson, okay? Destiny does not have that range in his, like, he just, like, mentally cannot even contemplate being as conductive to speech as is Jordan Peterson. And it's not like I'm writing too hard, you know, like, you know, writing. I'm not even doing that. I, I'm not even a fan of Jordan that much. But it's also just so blatantly obvious when you see the compare and contrast. And even when uh, Jordan Peterson juts out and says, uh, you know, presupposition or whatever, that's a big word, but it isn't even that that makes him emotive. It's that he's actually emoting like a human being. Destiny cannot do that. Being able to play well with others. And it's a very, very intractable problem. There's no evidence in the social science literature at all that hyper-aggressive boys by the age of four can ever be socialized in the course of their life. The penological evidence suggests that if you have multiple offenders, your best bet is to keep them in prison till they're 30. And the reason for that is it might be delayed maturation, you know, biologically speaking, but most criminals start to burn out around 27. So it spikes, it's a big spike when puberty hits, and then stability among the hyper-aggressive types. So actually what happens is the aggressives at four tend to be aggressive their whole life, and then they decline after 27. Uh -huh. The normal boys are not aggressive. They spike at puberty and go back down to baseline, right? And so you don't really rehabilitate people in prison for obvious reasons. I mean, look at the bloody places. They're great schools for crime in, in large. But if you keep them there until they're old enough, they tend to mature out of that, except the worst of them, tend to mature out of that predatory, short-term oriented lifestyle. So. Yeah.
Yeah, and they, okay, that's okay, the I force did. issue. Which yeah, I, I agree, I agree. So I, fundamentally, to, to clear uh, my, my, um, I guess my stance up, I agree that fundamentally you're not building society on force. Uh, if for no other reason, because there'd be so much friction, it would fly apart at the seams, right? You, you can't force Do you them. get resistance if yeah, you use force? fundamentally we're building off of cooperation. You want to invite people to participate in society. I agree with that. I just, I feel like once you start to hit certain thresholds or certain points and you've got so many different types of people involved, um, at some point we're going to have to have force around the edges and the guardrails just to make sure that we don't allow, are you familiar with like tit-for-tat systems? Very. Yeah, tit-for-tat is probably a really important part of our evolutionary biological history and an important part of the animal kingdom. And I think to some degree that tit-for-tat punishment is important is that to- force or justice? You can call it what it is. No, but... no, no. I'm curious what you think. I'm, I'm very, this is a very serious question. Yeah. Because the tit for tat, the tit for tat is very bounded, right? It's yeah. like, you cheat, I whack you, and yep. then I cooperate. Right? Yeah. So, and, and I do think that there's a model there for what we actually conceptualize as justice. Sure. It's like you don't get to get away with it. But the goal is the reestablishment of the cooperative endeavor as fast as possible. Of course, I agree. But in a reductionist way, we're kind of just using justice here as a stand-in for force, right? Well, because I, I think there's a tit-for-tat well, system. Good, a tit for, a tit, so there are different types of tit-for-tat systems, right? You've got tit-for-tat, you've got tit-for-tat-tat, you've got there's all sorts of types of systems where maybe you'll let somebody make a mistake one or two times, but you can't have a tit 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 system because then somebody can come in and take advantage of it. Yes, so that's just the problem with the compassionate left, exactly. by the way. For, to some extent, sure, it can be. Okay, another issue with destiny. So tit for tat gets brought up by destiny so he it, i mean it, he ought to know enough about it for it to be something he could debate about now here's the thing jordan peterson gives him an insightful question like okay is it justice or is it punishment and you know what destiny fumbles on that he obfuscates and mentions something else let's go on um or a problem with the right that's far too forgiving of donald trump <laughs> uh, but i would say that that pat part the you can call it justice i think justice is a perspective a force right where some people might consider a force to be just the cop that arrests the murderer and other people might consider that force that tat to actually be injustice because the the murderer was responding to environmental conditions blah 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 or was yeah, that's a whatever. stupid theory that Which, responding to environmental conditions theory because well, I mean, here's it why it's, no it's not well, I mean, because essentially that's see destiny should have let that one go because now he's going to get felted and i haven't seen this written house so, 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 so here's why right, with, so if you assume that there's a causal pathway from early childhood abuse to criminality, mm -hmm. let's say, which is the test case for environmental determination of the proclivity for the exploitation of others, okay. then it spreads, to, it spreads near exponentially in populations. That isn't what happens. So here, here's the data. Most people who abuse their children were abused as children, but most people who are abused as children do not abuse their children. And the reason for that is because if you were abused, there's two lessons you can learn from that. One is identify with the abuser. The other is don't, I, right, exactly. And what happens, and if this didn't happen, every single family would be abusive to the core very rapidly. Yeah. What happens is the proclivity for violence itself, it, it dampens itself out with it as a consequence of intergenerational transmission. So the notion that privation is a pathway to criminality, that's not, that's not a, that's not a well-founded, that's not a well-founded formulation. And, and there are an infinite number of counterexamples, and they're crucial. See, that's brilliant. Again, Destiny would never bring that up. And it, again, it sounds like I'm being really one-sided with the analysis, but it's like so true. Destiny's just not that smart. It's literally like a, a sharp 14-year-old talking to a fully grown man and it's just not even close and yeah that is a brilliant point i don't even want to agree because it's like too good uh -huh. some of the best people i know and I, I mean that literally are people who had childhood so absolutely abysmal that virtually anything they would have done in consequence could have been justified you know and they chose not to turn into the predators of others and that was a choice and often one that caused them to reevaluate themselves right down to the bottom of their soul and so that casual association of relative poverty even with criminality we know also we know this too you take a neighborhood where there's relative poverty the young men get violent they don't get violent because they're all hurt and they're victims. They get violent because they use violence to seek social status. And so even in that situation, it's not, oh, the poor, poor. It's no wonder they're criminal because they need bread. It's like, sorry, buddy, that's not how it works. The hungry women feeding their children don't become criminals. The extraordinarily ambitious young men who feel it's unfair that their pathway to success become violent. And that's that's 100% well documented and generally by radically left-leaning scholars. Sure, so, I don't disagree with any of that. Wealth inequality in areas is a much better predictor of crime than, than poverty. Than right, but it's a very yeah. specific form yeah. of crime. It's sure. status seek. He's getting mogged. Again, he's like, again, jutting his arm out about to stab Destiny with his ballpoint pen. Seeking crime by young men, mm -hmm. right? Well, but, but that shows you what the underlying motive is. It's not even redress of the economic inequality. It's actually the men striving to become sexually attractive by gaining position in the dominance hierarchy. Well, I, think be, I, think be, I think you have to be really careful with that assessment, though, because you can say that it's not economically, uh, it's not seeking economic. Why do you have to be careful? The biggest because, predictor because, because, male... Well, because we're assuming that people that commit crime in these types of circumstances are status seeking and not trying to seek uh, economic remedy. But That's it might exactly be, what it, we're assuming. But it might be the case, for instance, that in economically prosperous areas, that the men there aren't actually seeking economic prosperity they're also just trying to elevate status but they do it through economic prosperity it's potential right they do it they do it with a long that just proved jordan's point what a fucking idiot longer term vision in mind see just because you say it fast doesn't mean you're right sure, sure they're trying to elevate i wouldn't disagree with that in, in the least sure. but they do it with a much longer time horizon in, in mind and we know this partly because there have been detailed studies of gang members for example in chicago who are trying to ratchet themselves up the economic ladder but they do it with a short-term orientation most of them think they're going to be dead by their early 20s sure. so they're trying to maximize short-term gain so it has nothing to do with the with the redress of economic inequality, except in the most fundamental sense. And it is status driven because they're they're looking for comparative status. Sure, I, I, I just I don't think any human being has baked in a desire to seek economic prosperity. I think that that's like a third order. He literally just said that it was for status, not economic prosperity, primarily. That's the whole dissertation. That was the whole disagreement of destiny. 
with that first spiel by Jordan Peterson, what a fucking idiot. Again, so low IQ relative to like what people say. I mean, it's just appalling. I bet the average IQ of his Reddit is like 90. Ugh. The thing that we look for. And fundamentally, it's probably more like safety security for ourselves and then status seeking for other things. I think like that changes when you have children. Um, no, well, I mean, the safety security your status your is children. relevant or starts to become irrelevant at that point. I mean, depending on how you do your status, right? <laughs> you can't do See, see how Jordan Peterson's like, dude, this guy's such a fucking idiot. Like, seriously, just a joke. That every time we have a discussion, well, I'm just saying, for instance, one of the important things for my child is to be able to send my child to a good school. I need to have an elevated status, right? I need to be able to buy a house in the right school district. I need to be able to pay the education. Right, but you're not it. telling me, I hope, mm -hmm. that the driving factor behind your desire to care for your children is an elevation in your status. No, but I'm saying that the elevation of status might be what allows you to take care of. So, for instance, one of the biggest predictors. Of what? Okay, why does that even matter? Getting married is, is already status or position. Well, I, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying Felted. Oh my God, Destiny. What a fucking L. He's, he literally put up a sideways L for himself. I mean, it's just fucking oblivious. How dumb. Jesus Christ. There's like a, there's a, I know all these now right? he's stuttering. Ugh. Into, yeah. Okay, look, mm -hmm. we're running out of time. <laughs> you're good. I'm okay, smart. Okay, you're okay, smart. Yeah, you're sharp. yeah, yeah, yeah. Jordan Peterson just cashed it in the dub. He's like, okay, this guy's done. Uh, I know all of these can play into it, yeah. Okay, look, mm -hmm. we're running out of time. <laughs> you're good. I'm okay, smart. Okay, you're okay, smart. Yeah, you're sharp. That, that tit for tat thing. I'm he condescendingly said, you're smart. You're sharp. See, when you're losing an argument with your uncle, that's what he'll say. He'll be like, no, you're a smart kid. But there he goes. Yeah, but the tat thing, there is some underlying built into probably our genes, right? Because you see it all throughout the animal kingdom, but there's some level of punishment or justice. some level of force. You justice. justice. No, but, but I, think, I think it's the right. It's I really justice think when you're the tatter, not when you're the titter, though, right? No, when you're the no, titter, no. It's just retribution. No, 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 I don't, no. don't think that's true either. Look, if you read Crime and Punishment, for example, one of the things you see that emerges when Raskolnikov gets away with murder, and it's a brutal murder, and he gets away with it, it's completely clear, and he has a justification for it. And what happens as a consequence is that that disturbs his own relationship with himself so profoundly that he can't stand it, such that when a just punishment is finally meted out to him, it's a relief. And that's not rare. And that is, like, there isn't anything more terrifying. This is why Crime and Punishment is such a great novel. There isn't anything more terrifying than breaking a moral rule that you thought you had the ability to break and finding out that you're somewhere now that you really don't want to be. And then that, you know, you know, there's nothing worse in your own life than waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. If you transgressed against a moral rule and now you're an outsider because of that, you live in no man's land, the fact that you have just re retribution coming to you, that can be a precondition for your atonement and your integration back True. into society. But it's probably important to note that depending on the system you exist in, those moral transgressions just aren't, right? So to take it back to, I'll use your leftist example, you might consider a uh, threat of force for somebody to get a vaccine to be a highly immoral thing that might be a transgression against some fundamental moral thing, but a person on the left might think that they're actually satisfying their moral requirements of society by doing so, much the same as a child soldier, or, or not only a child soldier, but maybe an older person that's committing intifada or some kind of Islamic terrorist thinks that they're fulfilling some moral calling as well. No right. doubt, no doubt that that's the case. That's why I was focusing in on the use of force, is right. that I think it's a rule of, a good rule of thumb policy that if you have to implement your goddamn scheme with force, then there's something wrong with the way it's formulated. Does there's it no reason every religious... we, could have used, we could have used a pure invitational strategy to distribute the vaccine. It would have been much more effective. And it was bad policy, rushed. We're in an emergency, we have to use force. It's like, no, no, you weren't. It wasn't, it wasn't the kind of emergency that justified force, not least because behavioral psychologists have known for decades that force is actually not a very effective motivator. It produces a vicious kickback. So, you know, one of the things, this is going to happen for sure, you know, is that the net deaths from people stopping using valid vaccines as a con consequence of general skepticism about vaccination is going to cause, in my estimation, over any reasonable amount of time, far more deaths than COVID itself caused. You, you violate people's trust in the public health system at your great peril, and you do that by using force, and we did that. And so you can see already that there's hordes of people who are vaccine skeptic. Very, You know, whenever Jordan Peterson finishes talking or when he's about to, oftentimes when you're looking up to someone, you wait for them to with like bated breath, like, oh, what is he going to say? But with Jordan Peterson, he's condescending to destiny subconsciously. So he doesn't even give a fuck about what Destiny's going to say. He just stops talking when he figures out that he's like already out of things to generalized say. Generalized skepticism that to some degree you were rightly decrying. It spreads like wildfire, and no wonder, because if you make me do something, I'm going to be a little skeptical of you for a long time. You know, this conversation, we're here voluntarily. Okay. Like, we're trying to hash things out, and in good faith, you know? But neither of us compelled the other to come here, and neither of us are compelled to continue. And so that makes it a fair game. And a fair game is something that everyone can be invited to. And I suppose that's something that's neither right nor left, you know, hopefully, right? Something we could conceivably agree on. And I also think that I don't have any illusions about the fact that there are people on the right who would use power to impose what they believe to be their core. So, I mean, this is such a big Jordan W that it's smothering. Like, whatever's driving polarization uh -huh. doesn't seem to be as tightly related to the creation of those internal bubbles as you might think. Like, I, I've looked at a number of studies that have investigated to see whether people are being driven into homogenized... Inf okay, so Destiny um, was prompted to give his concluding thoughts, and instead of felting Jordan Peterson on a myriad of different things he could have picked up upon, he has a ton of notes, by the way, but he just says, oh, we need to be more bipartisan, which is just the biggest centrist cop-out. 
consensus that I have is it's not necessarily that homogeneity has increased. It's that homogeneity has increased as a byproduct of the bubbles becoming larger. So for instance, it might be that I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, so a, a town in, or city, really, in Nebraska, right? It might have been that 50 years ago, uh, there are bubbles in living in Omaha, and there are different bubbles for living in Lincoln. And there might be bubbles in Toronto or neighborhoods in Toronto, or there might be bubbles in Vancouver. But now as the internet exists and things become more uh, internationalized, these bubbles are, it's not just a bubble that exists in these cities. Now the bubbles have come together. Yeah, and well, as a result of them coming together. Problem. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or a globalization problem or a communication yeah, problem. Yeah, but you run into an issue where somebody might yeah. be in a particular city or state and have a really strong opinion about what uh, AOC says, but they don't know anything about their local political scene. And I think that that's an issue because the what this is just pure agreement cope this is just straight up out of the 2017 playbook of dave rubin like we should have a free market of ideas we should totally just jerk each other off we should totally just have agreement over these placid interests okay yeah bro cool story Jesus. Well, it's gotten so large and they're encompassing so many people now and you're expected to have like a similar set of beliefs between all of these different people now that might live in totally different places that's i think a big issue mm -hmm. we're running into yeah well that could be we'll close with this i mm -hmm. think that might be one of the unintended consequences of hyperconnectivity, sure. right, is that we're driving those uh, that, that get rigid and that we also... It's like I'm in purgatory and it's where like two people, center left, center right, disagree with each other. No, no, thank you. Great. Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a good place to stop. Um, well, thank you very much for coming in today. That's much appreciated. And um, you're a sharp debater and, and good <laughs> on your feet. So that Not even true, bro. This was disappointing to be completely like, like I thought Destiny was going to lose, but this was way worse. He got fucking molly whipped. That's, that's fun to see. And I do think that your closing remarks were correct is that the... The alternative to talking is fighting, mm -hmm. right? Bruh. So when we stop talking, it's not like the dis disagreements are going to go away. Yeah. We will start fighting, yeah. right? Probably and and for talking, too, even talking right, yeah. right? Absolutely. And talking can be very painful because a conversation can kill one of your cherished beliefs. See how he's mocking or not mocking, but being condescending towards destiny? Talking can be very difficult. Good job, son. Here's your Soylent in your Fortnite. Oh my God. And you will suffer for that, although maybe it'll also help you. Mm -hmm. But the alternative to that death by offense is death. Right. Yeah. Right. So better to substitute the abstract argumentation for the actual physical combat. For sure. Right. Sometimes, right. like the worst relationships are the ones where uh, where couples fight a lot. It's yeah. Like, really right. bad ones where they don't fight well, ever, and then all of a sudden there's the, a yeah. The couples, who, the couples <laughs> yeah. who fight and reconcile. Exactly. Are the ones yeah, yeah. Yes. Exactly. All right. All right. Well, that was good. Thank yeah, you very thanks. much. And for everyone watching and listening on the YouTube platform, thank you very much for your time and attention. And to um, we're going to spend another another half an hour or so on the Daily Wire side. So uh, if you're inclined. No. To that, we'll I'm not paying for that part. shit. <laughs> no, thank you. Holy shit. Okay, to summarize the end of that debate, basically, and it was a talk, okay? But look, here's the thing. So the title of this thing was called Streaming, comma, Politics, comma, and Philosophy at Destiny. Okay, so streaming. Did Destiny bring up his streaming career in a way that made it interesting to anybody at all? No. Did he kind of appeal to an older guy and say, like, there's a lot of virtue to streaming contemporary politics alongside with all this Adderall filled video game hysteria? The answer is he didn't do that. OK, what about the third thing that I wanted to mention here? Politics. OK, did Destiny win any points politically? No. And when he did kind of get Jordan Peterson on the back foot, he wasn't rhetorically smart enough or on a level that could really compete with Jordan. And it was just not it was not opportune. And also, um. When it comes to philosophy, the last term in this uh, search, philosophy, obviously Molly Wick by a psychology professor, I think Jordan Peterson is or he's something like that. So at the end of the day, this is pathetic uh, by destiny. And am I really surprised? Honestly, yes, I was expecting it to be like 60, 40 uh, Jordan destiny, but it was more like 80, 20. So just horrible outing. My hair's fucked up. Very depressing. Very sad to see. See y'all in the next video. Adios.